Hi. In this episode of Conversations with Kip, I'm sharing a number of episodes that I've recorded with Matt Adams. Matt is someone who's undertake a serious study to uh, improve and develop his ability in data science. Uh, wa having watched him over four months and mentoring him in that process, uh, I spent an hour with him and a number of points came out that I think are useful. In this video segment, you'll learn a bit about what it takes to do self-study what data science is about, how to think about the edges of problems and the scope of what you're trying to define, how to uh, find accountability and be effective in your study. So this first part, we'll just introduce Matt, and then we'll go on to other segments and give more details behind that. Let's, uh, let's, hi, Matt. We've been talking for 15 minutes, but let's pretend that we're just starting our conversation. Hello, Kip, how are you? <laughs> I'm still good. I'm still good. So this is a conversation with Kip. Um, this is my friend, Matthew Adams, that uh, he pinged me last December asking about data science. And he called me, I think, in March and said, hey, I've decided to get serious about this. And uh, what would you advise me to do on learning more about data science. So, you know, under a little bit of brief tutelage, you know, maybe I give him a suggestion every two weeks or something, he goes off and then does stuff. And uh, as he kind of showed some, some samples of what he had given progress reports the last couple of weeks, I said, you know, yeah, you kind of learned some stuff there. It would be interesting, I think, to share what you've learned with others who pay attention to my YouTube channel. Is that a good description, That's, Matt? That is a good description, but you, you give me a little more credit. Um, I, uh, when I reached out to Kip, Kip uh, initially said, hey, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, not only would I love to talk to you for 15 minutes, but let's get regular and uh, talk every two weeks, to which I did not respond for four or five months. <laughs> <laughs> And then the rubber hit the pavement and I uh, uh, changed my tune. So uh, he's been more than accommodating. We've been uh, meeting on scrum meetings three times a week, plus, uh, plus Slack. Um, but I have had this wonderful opportunity. I, uh, just a touch of background from my side, I was working, so I have a master's of accountancy with a minor in information systems. And uh, that led me into working for PricewaterhouseCooper for uh, three years in what they call risk assurance. Um, it's uh, in another way of saying it's their compliance side. Um, so occasionally there, I found myself in doing roles such as reviewing scripts to make sure that uh, reports were being uh, produced complete and accurate or automating tasks. Um, and what I found was that when I was working on those sort of tasks, I lost track of time or I would work late and not, um, and not mind it or be interested in learning more and like excited to show my friends some of the things that I was doing. And I realized this is what I should be devoting myself to. This shouldn't be an accessory of my job. This should be my job. In this segment, Matt talks a bit about how he engaged in self-study and the, the balance he had to find between finding structure and exploring the boundaries and exploring spaces that aren't structured. Um, and so I had the opportunity, ideally I would have studied during working and then done a clean pivot um, out of that job, but they were working me till 10 and midnight frequently. So I decided to just cut the cord, quit, and uh, live on my savings for a time while I'm studying to transition. So a couple of things that I think are interesting. The reason I think Matt's interesting is because he's been able to dedicate this time to it. So I think there's value from a, a lengthy, intense effort. And let me tell you, if you want to do something difficult, you know, I, I think one of the models for this is um, James Madison, who 
spent time studying before the Constitutional Convention. He went deeply for a number of months through everything that had ever been thought about constitutions. There's, there's value in finding that sort of space where you really can go deeply, and Matt's been able to do that in a certain sense. But let me, let's talk for just a minute about how you use that space, right? You quit. So you don't have anybody calling you. One thing that I invited Matt to do was to become involved with a, an open source project that, that I'm involved with, Geneva ERS. We have calls three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, Thursdays. It gave Matt every day, well, on those days, something to call him to, to say, hey, here's what's going on. Now, Matt wasn't directly involved with the project, but Geneva ERS is in data science space. It wasn't doing, and so it was relevant, but it provided him some place where he had to report back on what's going on and get asked questions about how are you using your time. Is that right, Matt? Yes, definitely. And I can think of many days where, where uh, the time was soon approaching and, you know, I've been studying throughout the day, but it's like, oh, I need a deliverable for that call. Let me make sure I have something that I can show for. <laughs> when I get to that call. So it really helped me to, hey, I have to be moving the ball every day so I can be presenting something, but also it was, it really helped me to keep a sense of professionalism. So the point that I make there is, if you do find yourself in a space where you can devote deep time, you also have to find ways of making that time effective. And that often requires finding people to report to that hold you accountable in some way for how are you using that time and how are you progressing? I would totally agree. I would say without accountability, I probably would have had half the pace that I do right now. Good. Okay, then go on. What, what, what are you going to share, I think, a little bit further? This is, uh, aside from, from here down, are technologies that I've learned since I quit in March. Um, and even that is just quite a prodigious list. Um, so this is, this was just the way I thought about it. The first thing I had to do was purchase a laptop that could do a considerable amount of things. Um, I decided between data camp and code Academy, which one I wanted to sort of trust my growth to. Um, and as far as I could tell, code Academy was more geared towards web development. Um, and data camp was more data analytics and projects based. And since I wasn't starting from zero, I thought the projects would be more useful to data camp. Um, reached out to camp and solidified that. How was that as, as, as far as a, a base place to go? Oh, I really like data camp. Um, personally here, I can show you just a touch of it. What that looks like. Um. So it's really like aesthetically attractive, of course. Um, and what I did was I found this Python and data scientist is a career track within that. So I clicked on that and then I was moving through it consistently. And what I found was after a certain amount, there were things that I wanted to hunt and peck certain skills. Yep. So I sort of abandoned this um, yep. career track in order to choose specific skills that I wanted to learn. Yep. Um, but for example, if we went here, here's sort of what that looks like. It'll give you a, a video, maybe a three or four minute video, and then uh, testing like this. Yeah which comes with hints or answers, but you lose experience points if you ask for hints. So that's the coward's way out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, um, that's interesting. That's kind of a gutsy thing to do to commit yourself to it. I mean, you have to kind of judge if you're being lazy <laughs> or if you're, you know, being disciplined about, I'm not going to waste my time going through the structure of everything that somebody else thought about. There's other things that I think are more important, isn't it? And and to be fair, when I when I stepped away from that data analytics 
uh, core, uh, pathway that they gave me. And I started to look at the other accessory things said, okay, uh, one thing that I want to learn about is machine learning. Um, another thing that I want to learn about is like exploratory data analysis. So when I see a data set, what's the first thing I should do, you know, just to feel out the data set, find out how many nulls there are, find out the shape of the data, what the averages look like, those sort of things. And the more I looked into those, the more I realized those are the courses that were the rest of the path that I haven't done yet. So it's like, oh, well, I maybe should have just continued because they did know. Best. Yeah, OK. But now I mean, feel more comfortable doing it. Yep, and having, having explored the territory yourself rather than just follow the map, you have a sense of how those things are connected. Definitely. In this segment, Matt uh, goes into seeing how this this ability to connect to other things and find out what the scope is and where to stop his study and how it's connected to other parts and yet how to specialize in his own way is an important part of doing self-study to know the boundaries post-reductionism and, and having a being a view of a generalist how to find the, the landscape that you're working in to find new problems that you're going to so solve. I did Python uh, and Python has a lot of these libraries um, that's what makes Python so valuable. Uh, hey, if I want to do R, which is really statistics based, I can, or if I want to do MATLAB, which is really science based, I can just import a science library into Python and do it here. Um, this scikit-learn was for, that's your machine learning and those sort of things. Um, but one thing yeah. I have to say so about that, go ahead. So, no, I, I sense the pause there. Tell me about that. Is, um, so imagine like self-teaching yourself nursing maybe. And, well, I know medicines. I know these things. Oh, I'm really interested in medicines. What, how specifically like, oh, that's chemistry and that's lab. That's somebody else. Or, hey, I'm a nurse and this bone is broken, but I can't really see how it is. I should look into how I could do that. Like an x-ray tech, that's also a different job. Yep. You sort of naturally fall into these other interests because it's all included, but within like a professional sense, those are those jobs are done by other people. Yep. Um, and so that's what I found is when I was learning this so far, I wanted to delve into machine learning. And, and what I found after doing some of the trainings, I was like, this is really hard, very strange. Um, and most difficult of all, like, I just don't know how to apply it. Like I could run the machine, but I just don't know what to aim it at. Um, and so what I eventually came to, I watched a couple of YouTube videos and, and the people that do this for Google have PhDs. Yeah. And so that's when I realized, okay, that's a different professional than I am as a data analyst for now. And perhaps I could evolve. That is my evolution track is to go into that someday but not today. Or another thing that I did is I got a Raspberry Pi and I turned it into a server and started to worry about nodes and those sort of things. And that's, that's a network analyst. That's yep. also another person professionally. Or I started to worry about, okay, how do the cables work? How big a gauge do I need for this? How, and that was like headed into uh, electrical engineering of, hey, let me get an Arduino and start to build Arduinos. Like, that's also out of my wheelhouse. But I've done enough to learn accessory things so I could talk to those people. But that's another thing of self-taught learning is knowing where your scope is. Okay. So, you know, but the thing that comes from that, Matt, I've talked about this in other videos, is something called post-reductionism. James Burke talks about this idea that the world's been organized around reductionism for 500 years. Descartes said, you take a problem, you got to break it down to smaller pieces so you can control the variables, so you can study that farther. And we've been using that effectively for 500 years to build the world of knowledge we have today. But it creates these domains, these independent domains that people specialize more and more in. James Burke says, we're at the bottom of what can be known because we've broken the problems down so far. The new problems that exist in the world exist between the domains. 
And that's kind of what you, you're doing there is you're getting a sense of what is the connection between the domains. And if you don't have a sense of what's the connections between the domains, then you you don't have a sense of where the new problems are that need to be solved. In this segment, Matt uh, explains what he learned about efficiency and about data science and the, the, the tooling around data science and how efficiency can be important to solve some problems. So one thing, other thing I'd like to say is that just from my perspective, Python is a great language, but Python is not intended to be something that we, you would, if I were building a system, I wouldn't build it in Python if it intended to be run every day. Python, mm -hmm. Python is interactive, it's very fast in how, it, but it's an interpreted language. It isn't a compiled language and compiled languages are more efficient. It takes mm -hmm. more upfront to compile, and so it's not as fast in exploration. But once you get to something that you want to track over time consistently, Python will use more com compute capacity than is needed because it's not intended to be an efficient compiled language. So some of working with hearing this Geneva ERS every day or every few days has really lent me to that efficiency brain of, okay, yes, the computers can do it, but how can we make it faster? How can we make it more efficient? How can we make it more streamlined for these processes that have to happen, you know, a million lines in seconds? Well, let me ask, you ran into some problems where the computer, you couldn't solve it. The computer couldn't do it because it wasn't efficient enough, right? Right. Yeah, on two different occasions, there was one, for example, where uh, my computer has 16 gigs of RAM, uh, and I asked it to hold a 17 gig file, and then just pressed go and watched what happened. <laughs> and so it it actually went after it, which I suppose that it would have like guessed the file, seen that it was too big, and thrown an error. But it just went after it anyways. And I suppose there's probably some memory hacks going on in there that what it uses it uses swap files. It takes portions of memory and stores it to disk and then tries to swap those in and out of memory. And if the problem is such that that's efficient, then that will work for a problem. In some problems, that's not efficient. And it, slow, it does slow down the process tremendously because now basically your disk is becoming your memory. Mm -hmm. so, so I did that one as well as there was another one where I used uh, Seaborn. Um, right here to plot th thousands of points. And I was like, you know, how far do I have to push this Seaborn? How much is efficient to plot and how much is going to break it? What I did was I did samples at how long does 10 lines take? A hundred lines, a thousand lines, 10,000 lines. And so I had four points and then I was able to turn that into a line. So when I ran it for five, hundred thousand lines and it failed at a certain time i can back into how many lines it approximately had when it failed so that's yep. how i know that it approximately had fifty thousand records done when it collapsed five hundred thousand lines i then backed into should have taken 23 days yeah. this is my uh, computer crying yep. cpu utilization nearly maxed memory capped this is becoming slower exponentially. So I've been doing a few of these things as well as time trials on different things of, hey, let me do this process using NumPy and let me do it again using Pandas or let me try reiterating this and finding what's the most efficient time thing. Um, and that was also, I would say, a big part of my learning is not only how to make these things work, but how to make them work quickly and um, Shoot, I've said efficiently so many times, but uh, no, but the, so, but that, Matt, but what's the what's the impact to the problem you were trying to solve, right? Being you can be efficient, just to be a, a game and seeing how fast a computer can do something. But talk about it in terms of the data. What problem? What impact does efficiency have upon what you were trying to get at with the data? Yeah. So. Um, 
several things. For example, one of the suggestions that Kip gave me was instead of, hey, doing these one day, two day, or, you know, single hour projects, let's get elbows deep into a big data set. Uh, so he pointed me towards this Virginia government, state state government um, records. It's their whole ledger um, to like a significant granularity, not to the exact line items, I think, but it's to like a very uh, deep granularity. And uh, so it's from 2003 to current. And what I found is that boils down to even just the expense side, not even the revenue side, just the expense side. By the time I downloaded it all, I think it was 120 files and somewhere around 15 gigs, each file being about 100 megabytes, more or less. They're quarterly files. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so when I went to go, you know, um, work with that to find a maximum of of the sum, the overall sum of each of those was easy because I could look at each file, find the total, and then throw it out of memory and then look at the next and throw it out of memory. But there are certain processes where it has to be able to see all of the files at the same time. And I just can't do that at this time, not on my computer. And I think the, the point there, Matt, is that it, 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 it limited the kind of analysis you could do. You could gain greater understanding against data over longer periods of time if you do things efficiently. And there are some things that it's valuable in having that long perspective. Definitely. So I was talking to my friends about uh, some of the real, Kip and I had a discussion once of how it used to be done, efficiency of how it used to be done, because We've never had more computing power than we do now, and there used to be a lot less, and they still used to crunch huge numbers with small computing power and how that used to be done. And uh, so I was telling my friends about some of the methods that, that I had heard from, from you that we were discussing, and, uh, and they just laughed. They were two CS guys, computer science guys who are developers. They said, if, if the computer can't hack it, you just buy a bigger one. <laughs> That's that's true until you get to be the largest corporations in the world, in which case sometimes computers don't scale linearly to solve the problem. Yeah, and so I think that showed a little, I'm not sure if like immaturity or ignorance there of like, there's a certain point where like you have to be efficient. You just can't buy that yep. kind of computing power anymore. No, no, some problems cannot be solved by just any more on computing power. Yeah. So this has been a, a big thing to not only learn how to code, but how to learn streamlined coding and efficient use. In this segment, Matt talks more specifically about data science and about the surprising aspects of data science. The data can challenge our assumptions more directly than narratives can. Data makes us think differently when the things we see in the data don't match what we believe from the data and how data can surprise us. Hey, if we look at Virginia payroll, government payroll from 2003 to 2020, how would we expect payroll to change? And my just hunch instinct was that I expected it to go up tremendously over 20 years of just uh, government creep. Um, and what I found that it was a very insignificant number. So if we have 2003, it's just over 5 billion that here in 2017 would have been 6 billion, which is insignificant, like very small increase overall. So much so that I said, I want to map this against inflation just to see if it's even keeping up with inflation. So the red line is 2003 inflated and blue is actual payroll expense. And what you can see from this is that not only has the payroll not ballooned, it hasn't even kept up in a sense of value. It hasn't even kept up with the value of inflation. Yep. So a friend of mine asked me at that point, 
okay, is that because people are getting less take home value or is it because there's less people because this is not on a per person basis? The yep. number of employees was not quite as readily available. Um, so I was able to find the data of employees for only four years, 17, 18, 19, 20. And the payroll first employees doesn't exactly map to each other perfectly, but I can see that employees is going down on a consistent trend. Which blew my mind. Yeah. Um, I, I even did the calculation of what's the value under between red and blue in this instance. What's the, uh, the value, I guess, of, of, you could call it savings. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and it was some over, over the 17 years, I think it was something like $9 billion of savings compared to the inflation line. Yeah. Sort of, sort of interesting. Well, you know, so right there, but right there, you have decisions that can be made <clears throat> based upon the data. The data speaks back at you in a way that defied your beliefs. Measure of reality, the quantification of the West from 1400 to 1600. And the author in that book talks about how data can, and it, it, narratives might challenge our beliefs, but data and these kinds of points that you're pointing out can challenge our beliefs even farther. Because if it doesn't fit what we think the narrative is, we have to change to understand what the data is really telling us. And that's what the power of what you just see there and, and your reaction to that. As a, a side note and a tangent, I was looking through some Tableau visualizations, um, some of the grades that I want to copy or even take notes from. And one of them was, how diverse is your state? So it had all the states and diversity and I'm from Utah and I feel like Utah's not very diverse. And so I was going into it, looking at that. And so it was apparently states and territories and number one, least diverse was Maine uh, or number two, least diverse was Maine and number one, least diverse was Puerto Rico. <laughs> and it's cause, cause everyone in Puerto Rico is Puerto Rican. And that yeah. was like, just totally nowhere near what I would have expected from the data. Yeah, right. I mean, that's the point of this. That's the point of this data science, right? That's what, that's the value that you now have, have learned how to bring that to somebody else to make sure that the data is talking back and, and it, that their, their, their view of the world is what really is happening in the world. Absolutely. In this discussion, Matt talks about a programming exercise he did that was kind of off the beaten path from data science. What's the benefit here? It's not directly applicable to data science, but there's something about this taking on a big problem, an unstructured problem, and finding ways through that that solidified his knowledge. I think there's value in understanding that. So the Enigma machine was used by the Germans in World War II to send encrypted messages um to their forces to u-boats to everything uh there were several editions of enigmas made during the war this one um so i tried to well simply put it's a battery and incredibly complicated wiring and light bulbs so the entire machine is strictly mechanical um and there's no computer processing of any sort it's just really intricately wired light bulbs so how that works, the battery goes, and so if you were to press a key, the key, say you pressed F, it would come out to the board, and uh, these are sort of a plug board like a, an old school phone operator. Yeah. So an F may then become an H, depending on how it's plugged in. Then the H comes up here and goes into these rotors. These rotors have A through Z, and then for this type of enigma, there's eight different rotors. So you can lift the hood and place maybe this one's rotor one, this one's rotor four, rotor eight, and then rotor seven. So the eight can be placed in random orders. 
at random orientations. So they start on different letters. And then within each rotor, there is a bezel that you can change. So the randomization can also be different. So each rotor has three different layers of encryption in each, each one. And then potentially, um, I can't show you, but after that, there's a mirror per se. They call it a mirror, but it's a, a sort of a sneaky fifth rotor that turns it around yeah. and pushes it all the way back through. Okay. So I um, built this in code. And initially, I so self-guided, there was no instructions, no anything. I did it entirely just searching, which um, debugging this, since it gets encrypted 14 times, debugging it was an absolute bear. Um, because it literally could be anywhere where things are going wrong. Um, so a brief overview of that. This is some of that. You have to import a ton of libraries, um, work on creating standard alphabets and creating rotors uh, and rotors that are randomized, um, bouncing between letters and numbers. So, hey, I need to transfer B into G, but since the bezel is different, I need to do the whole thing offset so it would be easier to do in numbers. So let's trade yep. B into a two and G into a 11 or, you know, whatever. So bouncing back and forth in and out of letters and numbers. Um, this one is rotor inverting. So it, so that I can run all my rotors backwards on the way back through. Here are the reflectors. Here's the plug board. Um, here's that main. The other thing is as you go, these, every time you press a button, the rotors move. So the first one moves, think of it as a second minute an hour hand. This one spins every time. This one spins every 26 or 13 times this one. And there is just, I mean, I could explain it for days. It's incredibly difficult, but I did it. So these are, this is the logic of the rotors moving. Okay. Here's the actual translations. Um, between we have plug board, first rotor, second rotor, third. Um, here's the beta wheel, which is the fourth rotor reflector. And then here it is coming back through. Yeah. And then we have this final message. And so I was able to find online a sort of Rosetta Stone of an actual message that was here's encrypted, here's decrypted German, here's translated to English, and here's all the settings to get you there. So, which was just my absolute without it, I couldn't have done this period. Um, but so this is effectively the answer key from the Rosetta Stone that I was talking about. Uh, yep. This is what it should end up as. So what we're seeing here is the transitions of the letters. Okay, so the letters started as L and ended as K. And okay. these are each of the transitions in between. And then this is the rotor position at the end of that movement. Okay. Uh, and then when I got down to the very bottom, I put in an accuracy test and I got, oh, whoops, wrong button. I got 372 out of 372 characters. So I, I figured it out. So not only is this was initially I had created the rings out of random, just set the, the rings randomly. And what I realized is, hey, if I want to decode this, I can't do it because it's, it re-randoms every time I run it. So I can't run it back. Ah, yeah. So yep. I looked into it and found out what the actual configurations of the real machine is and plug those in. So this is the accuracy on an actual authentic German message that I actually was able to decrypt it, but I don't know German. So what I did was um, I couldn't figure out how to put spaces in it. That one eludes me. I tried a couple of different clever things. I couldn't, couldn't make it happen. 
but I took this one from the one with spaces and then I made a Google Translate API. And here is okay. the final output of that message. And it's yeah. A, it's a field promotion. Yeah, there you go. Which was pretty fun. So <laughs> this, how does this, you were doing this before you kind of started data science, what my sense. Well, I, um, this was a, this was an exercise in solidifying what I already was learning. So to build this, I had to use um, GitHub, which was a new technology to me. This was built thoroughly in Python, which was also okay. very new to me uh, and those sort of things. So this really helps solidify those skills. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't, it wasn't, you wouldn't, it's a little bit data science related, but it's, Barely. it's a, it's a project you did that laid, tested you across a bunch of foundational elements of IT. Is this on GitHub? Um, yes, but, uh, in traditional that wasn't a very confident that, answer. It's, it's very messy. Um, it's in between two and three files. Um, and then once I reached this once, I was like, okay, well now let me go and silver plate it. So I went to go make it better and instead I broke it and then I got bored. So I'd never fixed it. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the nature of about uh, over half of the GitHub projects, right? Um, but there is value in there. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Let's go to the, let's go to that last question though. What's next? Where does this go? What, what would, if you were, if you were talking to somebody that was thinking about going into data science, kind of with your background or something, your interest level. What would you advise them? So I went to school with, we had a, a study group. There was three of us, myself, Adam, and Valerie. Uh, and we all got the information systems minor and we were all pretty nerdy, that tech savvy per se. And there was a time back in uh, May when I could tell them what I was doing and it was interesting and we were on the same page and we can't talk anymore. I'm just not even in the same sphere as them. The things that I'm doing are so far past what they're trained to do. Um, that, that was a measure for me of like seeing how far I've come is it takes me a really long time to explain some of these things to them because I have learned so much. I would say if you're trying to learn self-led learning between YouTube and your keyboard, I don't think you're going to get far. I think that's really difficult to have that level of self-discipline and fully 100% teach yourself is, is a grit that I did not have. Um, so having something that's led like data camp where they have concisely put, here's what you need to know. And here it is in a very digestible format helped me tremendously. Um, the second thing I would say is accountability is absolutely crucial life or death when it's self-led for myself. And I do remember, uh, Kip, you saying to me that, Hey, if I can't learn to be self-led, then I'll have a boss for the rest of my life. And I have thought about that one heavily this whole time. Um, but I think there's a certain amount of Maybe someday I'll be able to be self-led, but that accountability is a crucial piece for me and has been throughout this whole experience. Um, maybe someday I'll be able to be fully autonomous, but at this point I can't. And especially when learning is so difficult and I was grinding so hard that like having someone to bounce and say, hey, actually you're sort of headed the wrong direction or here's technologies you haven't even thought of that you should think of. Those things were invaluable. Like, so valuable. Well, let me react there to a couple of points, right? 
what I heard you say is data camp was helping you get started. You know, I'm thinking basically of, of the analogy of a, a car sitting on a sheet of ice, right? <laughs> that if 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 you if you put the gas full bore, you're going to spin your wheels and you're going to stay in the same position. What data camp did for you is it allowed you to get some momentum, get started. It gave you some way to get started. <clears throat> but, you know, the people that build data camp, there has to be a, a large enough body of people that are interested, that, are you, that those topics are useful for to justify somebody making a training course. And if you want to solve new problems, then there's nobody that will have had any economic incentive to make a training course for the new problem you're trying to solve. You have to, at some point, be able to go beyond the training materials and direct yourself. On the directing yourself, right? I, I remember I've had people through the years tell me, well, I, I, don't want, I want to own my own business. I want to be my own boss. I've often thought, you know, you'll be lucky if you at least have one boss that's called a customer. Because <laughs> if you don't have a customer to tell you, give you feedback about what you're doing is useful or not doing, then you could be wasting your time. And that's, that's where you have to find that, that, that balance between doing something new, but finding ways that that something new is useful to others and take that feedback from them to direct how you go and where you go next. Definitely. That uh, iter iterative learning and not just in, hey, my code doesn't work, now it works, more of a, hey, am I learning the right things? Asking, asking the people, hey, am I headed the right direction? Potentially, is that sort of on the same page? Yes. Yep. Yep. That getting that feedback, finding ways of getting feedback about the usefulness of your exploration into new spaces is very helpful to in your self-directed learning processes. Early on, when you and I were talking, there was such a disparity of knowledge that we couldn't have a conversation without me coming away with that 10 step to do list. Of, yes. I got to learn GitHub. I got to learn Shell. I got to learn PowerShell. I got to learn Bash. I need to figure out how those Spala. mix. Spark. Yep. Yeah. It was just, what's Apache? I don't know what Apache is. Well, look into Apache. Find out what Apache is. Uh, and that dialogue has helped me a lot to build really good foundations of what really is um, foundational to data and those sort of things. Yeah, very good. Very good, Matt. Not very many people, uh, I haven't met very many people that have taken on the challenges directly you have, and I've been impressed watching <clears throat> you. The, the, as you just noted, our first conversations, there were a lot of things you didn't know. In the later conversations, there were things where you were explaining, oh, you were giving me insights on things. That's generous. And I was finding... <laughs> I was finding connections between things that, oh, yeah, I can see how that's connected to this thing over here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's been quite a ride. I'll let you know once this spark cluster gets up, then I'll really be able to lean back and have a good rest, maybe. Good. That'd be good. Yeah, you need those as well. Thanks for your time today, Matt. I think this has been, I think this will be interesting to a number of people. Hopefully, yeah, if it gets more than three views, then I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, if you have both your parents watch it independently, that'll get you a long ways there. Well, there we are, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> good work, Matt, thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you so much, you have a good one. I hope you've enjoyed these segments from Matt. Uh, Matt Adams, he's uh, worked very hard. There's not a lot of people that get to do this kind of thing. But in today's educational world, I think there's going to be, need to be more and more of people who take on these kinds of, of attacking new areas and retraining themselves to understand new problems. Matt's a good example of 
what some of the structures are and things you need to do in order to make that time effective, whether it's in data science or something else. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, sec series of conversations with Kip with Matt Adams. <laughs>